If a movie is deemed to be successful and profitable, particularly these days, there will likely be a sequel on the horizon. In certain cases, there will be more sequels than ever would have been thought necessary or possible. With these sequels either furthering existing stories or telling completely new ones, there will almost always be new characters introduced. This usually means that there isn't room for every main character from the previous movie, and while they can be written out of a story in literally limitless ways, a quick death is always a popular option. So with that in mind, I'm Ellie with What Culture here with 10 great movie characters killed off immediately in sequels. Number 10. Captain Boomerang in The Suicide Squad It was unclear in the build-up to James Gunn's The Suicide Squad whether it would be a reboot or a sequel to David Ayer's 2016 outing. In reality, the movie was something of a mix of the two. There were both new and returning characters, the latter including Rick Flagg, Harley Quinn and Amanda Waller, but there was no mention of their mission in Midway City from five years prior. There was one more returning character from the second DCEU outing back in 2016 in the form of Jai Courtney's Captain Boomerang. The Aussie with the pink unicorn fetish, however, didn't survive the ambush on Corto Maltese like Flag and Quinn. He, along with the majority of the first team, was brutally murdered on the beach while Bloodsport and co sauntered unmolested on the other side of the island. This does then beg the question though, why bother bringing him back at all? Number 9. Vanessa Kensington in Austin Powers' The Spy Who Shagged Me As the perfect James Bond spoof, Austin Powers over the course of the movie trilogy has ticked off just about every Bond-esque cliché possible. The action, the cars, the puns, the villains, even the names of the movies. And of course, Power's love interests have all been created with this particular imitation in mind. After International Man of Mystery, there was another Bondism for Powers to pull off, namely that 007 unfailingly has a different woman by his side for every adventure. This was something that needed to be solved at the beginning of The Spy Who Shagged Me. At the end of the first movie, Austin Powers got married and skipped into the sunset with Vanessa Kensington. At the start of the sequel, to make room for a new love interest in the form of Felicity Shagwell, the new Mrs. Powers had to be killed off. The easiest and most obvious way to do this? A retcon that she had been a fembot with machine gun jubblies from the start. Number 8. Vanessa Carlyle in Deadpool 2 in spite of the violence, the action, the fact that it was very clearly a superhero movie and the F-bombs being dropped from start to finish, at the beginning of Deadpool, Wade Wilson calmly told the audience that they were watching a love story. It may have been very tongue-in-cheek, but he wasn't wrong. Everything that Wade did in the movie was for Vanessa. He never thought he could be loved even before his run-in with Francis, but she was there for him no matter what, and of course, he got the girl in the end. Life just didn't have happiness planned for Deadpool, however. At the very beginning of the sequel, before the opening credits even rolled, Vanessa was killed. In true pool fashion, the movie made a joke about her brutal and abrupt death, but this was vital to give the titular character his arc for the story. By the end of the movie, Wade uses Cable's tech to go back in time and save Vanessa, so there's potential for her to appear in the threequel as though nothing happened, but even so, her death added a certain amount of emotion and poignancy you wouldn't typically associate with the merc with the mouth. Number 7. Smaug in The Hobbit – The Battle of the Five Armies There aren't many areas, if any, in which the Hobbit trilogy managed to live up to Peter Jackson's first trilogy in Middle-earth. What the prequels did have that The Lord of the Rings didn't, however, is a dragon, a fire drake from the north that held the key to much of the narrative. The entire premise of the first two movies was that Smaug had taken Erebor for his home, and the subsequently nomadic dwarves were journeying across all of Middle-earth to take it back. There were hints at the dragon during an unexpected journey, but Smaug wasn't seen in all his magnificence until the end of the desolation of Smaug. The second movie ended with the dwarves having infuriated the self-proclaimed king under the mountain as the dragon dripping with gold broke free of said mountain and headed towards the defenceless lake town. This was one hell of a cliffhanger, and the attack of Bard and his people was an incredible way to kick off the Battle of the Five Armies. Smaug laid waste to Lake Town, but in what felt like just five minutes, the scene was over. Smaug was dead, and that was that. Anyone expecting Smaug to play a bigger role in favour of Thorin's descent into madness and Billy Connolly on a pig was greatly disappointed. Number 6. Irene Adler in Sherlock Holmes – A Game of Shadows 
The life, profession and personality of Sherlock Holmes have typically forced him into the role of a loner. Save for the likes of John Watson and Mrs Hudson, Sherlock has very few friends or even acquaintances. What he did have, however, was something of a frenemy in the form of Irene Adler. Rachel McAdams' character played a prominent role opposite Robert Downey Jr.'s Sherlock Holmes in the first movie, as the world's greatest detective both chased her down as a thief and yet flirted with a deeper relationship. This was put to an end with the emergence of the new big bad in the sequel. The villain of the original movie was Lord Blackwood, but it didn't take much for audiences to assume Professor Moriarty would be stepping into the fray before too long. Sherlock's greatest ever nemesis had to prove himself as big a threat as his reputation promised from the start, and what better way to do that than kill off Irene Adler quickly and without fanfare. After deciding that she had grown too close to Sherlock to work effectively as an agent for him, Moriarty coldly and unapologetically murdered Irene by way of poison, leaving Mr Holmes without potentially his greatest ally. Number 5. Count Dooku in Star Wars Revenge of the Sith the Star Wars prequels told the story of Anakin Skywalker, from his humble beginnings on Tatooine through to taking his place at Emperor Palpatine's side as Darth Vader. There were a lot of moving pieces in the story, namely the Emperor's previous apprentices. Thanks to the Sith rule of two, Palpatine had to have an apprentice at all times, and of course, they had to be disposed of to ultimately make way for Vader. Maul was seemingly killed by Obi-Wan Kenobi, while Dooku lasted a little longer. Though the Sith Lord had a larger role throughout Star Wars The Clone Wars, Christopher Lee's villain didn't appear throughout Attack of the Clones too much. He appeared even less so in Revenge of the Sith. It was Anakin's murder of Count Dooku at the beginning of Episode 3 that truly started his path on the dark side, and it seems as though the man known as Lord Tyrannus was essentially included solely to give Skywalker that opportunity. He was behind the creation of the clone army, but that could have been Palpatine on his own, or anyone really. Star Wars needed someone expendable for Anakin to execute at the order of Palpatine, and this was Dooku before Revenge of the Sith really got going. Number 4. Laurie Strode in Halloween Resurrection There are few movie franchises with as many ups and downs in their time as Halloween. John Carpenter's original classic is one of the most influential horror movies ever, though it was only a matter of time before its welcome was outstayed. The franchise has enjoyed an upturn in recent years, but not enough to forget the awful Halloween Resurrection. The movie came along and completely retconned Laurie killing Michael at the end of H2O, and then to add insult to injury, it saw the death of Laurie herself. This, bizarrely, came at the request of Jamie Lee Curtis herself. The big conclusion at the end of Halloween H2O was that Laurie finally killed Michael Myers, yet the subsequent Halloween Resurrection rewrote that story so that the man Laurie decapitated was in fact an innocent man, allowing Michael to return for more. Not wanting to continue the character's story with such a murder on her conscience, Curtis requested Laurie be killed off in the first 10 minutes of the movie. Number 3. Alice Hardy in Friday the 13th Part 2 even in spite of Laurie Strode being killed off on more than one occasion, she has always returned to continue on as the protagonist of the Halloween franchise. The same, however, cannot be said for Alice Hardy, the first final girl of the Friday the 13th series. Way back in 1981, Alice survived the murderous streak of Pamela Voorhees and was the one who put said rampage to an end. She must have thought that it was all over when she took the villain's head from her shoulders, but no. In a move that shocked everyone, the surviving protagonist of the first movie was killed off immediately in the sequel. Nonchalantly going to the fridge, she found the head of Pamela Voorhees before herself being brutally killed by Jason. Sequels focus on new lead roles all the time, but such an unceremonious death for the previous one is less common. There have been multiple conflicting reports over the years as to why Alice was so unceremoniously killed off in the sequel, with actor Adrian King eventually revealing that she didn't even know about it until she arrived on set. There's no end to the potential stories the sequel could have told with its beloved final girl still alive, but it just wasn't meant to be. Number 2. Roxy Morton in Kingsman The Golden Circle Matthew Vaughan's Kingsman was a wonderfully eccentric and off-the-wall surprise hit back in 2014. The movie shot Taron Egerton towards stardom immediately, but unfortunately the rest of the franchise has struggled to keep up with the breakneck speed with which it started, and the direct sequel, The Golden Circle, wasn't received anywhere near as well as the original. The story saw Eggsy and Merlin head across the pond to work with Statesman, which presented its own set of problems. The idea was that Eggsy and Merlin were on their own, with no 
nowhere left to turn but their American cousins. This, however, would only be possible if everyone else involved in Kingsman were killed. Unfortunately, this included Roxy, the agent who had taken the Lancelot moniker after earning it in the first movie. Roxy was a fantastic character, someone without whom Kingsman's victory against Richmond Valentine wouldn't have been possible, and who meant a great deal to Eggsy. But towards the beginning of the sequel, she was unceremoniously blown up to make way for the likes of Whiskey, Ginger and Tequila. Number 1. Thanos in Avengers Endgame at the conclusion of Avengers Infinity War, Thanos did something that few comic book movie villains have ever been able to do. When he snapped his fingers and sat back to watch over a grateful universe, he did so knowing that he had won. There was nothing else on Thanos' mind other than correcting the universe. He could have done literally anything with the six Infinity Stones. He could have made himself a literal god as he did in the comics. But to resist such temptations in the MCU, he used the stones to destroy the stones. This left him weak and vulnerable. Coming into Endgame, there was always going to be a role for Thanos to play, but no one knew exactly what it was. Ultimately, it was Thanos coming out of 2014 that played the role of the main antagonist in the movie, as the Thanos that picked apart the Avengers with relatively little effort in Infinity War was killed within the opening moments of the movie. He had completed his quest and was happy enough to die believing that he had corrected the universe and that there was nothing Earth's mightiest heroes could ever do to undo it. This was a shocking and surprisingly abrupt end to one of the greatest comic book movie villains of all time. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed any, then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also, head over to Twitter and follow us there. And I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with What Culture. I hope you have a magical day, and I'll see you real soon.